Hey everyone, welcome to the Fireside Chat number 41 on Crushing Classical, Redefining a Thriving Classical Music Career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today Eileen and I have a guest on the show. David Bartosavich, my accountant, is joining us to break down all of this tax confusion. David goes through the new tax laws that impact individuals and how they'll affect musicians and what you can do starting in 2018 to drastically save money on the taxes you owe as a self-employed musician. This is a valuable conversation for all musicians to hear and so timely as we close out 2017 with the brand new tax bill that just passed the other day. Before we start, a couple of quick things. Please join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical, as well as crushing classical on Instagram. If you love what you see, it would mean so much to us if you would comment on posts and share them with your classical musician friends and colleagues. Also, if you love these podcasts, please take a moment to review Crushing Classical on iTunes. Having more reviews helps more musicians to find our podcast, and we really appreciate it. And if you haven't done it yet, join our group Classical Cats. It's an active group of people with lots of conversation going on in there. We also added lots of resources about social media, as well as a list of all the episodes we have ever published, organized by category. Join today at facebook.com slash groups slash crushing classical. Let's get started. Hey, David. Hey, Eileen. How are you? I am good. Hope you are well. Hey there. Hey, awesome. So, hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fireside Chat today. Today, we are diving in to a topic that I know everyone wants to hear because everyone loves them. Taxes. So... A while back, <laughs> a while back, we were doing an episode about finances, and I was preparing for it. And I asked everyone on my post on Facebook what their financial concerns were, and a ton of people quest, uh, posted questions that were about taxes. So that was when I realized I really needed to have an accountant on. And happily for me, David, you agreed to come on and talk about it. So really, thank you so much for being on the show today, David. Hi, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to uh, helping not only yourself, but uh, anyone else who listens to this uh, podcast and uh, hopefully answer any questions you all might have. Fantastic. All right. So tell me, can you just, let's start from the very super basics of tax preparation, because I can tell you what, I did not know um, all these terms. And so like going through and getting ready for this podcast, I was like, well, this is good for me too, because I don't always know exactly what all this stuff is for and what it means. So can you explain just like the basic, what's the difference between a W-2 and a 1099? You know, those the things you get at the end of the year. Right. Okay. Basically, uh, W-2 is a form that an in individual who is considered an employee by their employer would receive for the amount of gross wages and deductions and all that taken out at the end of the year. Okay. A 1099 is for any individual that is paid over $600 for the year and is considered a independent contractor, you know, independent laborer, you know, subcontractor, any of those um, terms or whatnot. And they would receive this 1099 showing how much this third party, this vendor paid them to do work for on their behalf, independently of being an employee. Okay. And you only get one of those if you made like 600 or more with that person, like if it was a church gig or something like that. Correct. Yeah. The total, they add up all the payments to you during the year. And if that is $600 or more, they should send one to you. If it's below 600, they do not have to. Now, of course, IRS says you still, you should still report that income. That's up to each individual in their own situation. I see. Okay. So then how do you divide up people's income into categories? Like I know that you have these different schedules. Like I know that I've seen Schedule C before, and you said something about a Schedule A. So what is, what's that all about? Well, basically, each individual um, will file a, a 1040 form, well, it's 1040-AZ, 1040-A, or 1040 itself. And each one depends on the amount of deductions or exemptions or um, other information they may have. Usually, I do a 1040 for everyone because that encompasses every possible scenario that is out there. So that is where you would basically show all of your income, all your deductions, credits, withholding, and so on. The Schedule A is what's called itemized deductions. And what that is, that is a form that accumulates certain types of deductions, such as you know state withholding or income taxes paid in, mortgage interest, real estate taxes, contributions, and other ones as well, too. And that, would re that total would reduce your overall gross income as compared to possibly standard deduction, either one, 
to help get to your lower taxable income. Okay. Now, the schedule, the schedule C is for those individuals who are considered self-employed, those individuals that would normally receive a 1099 miscellaneous or hold themselves out in, for a business venture. Um, they would follow. They would file that form, and that basically accumulates shows the income they receive for all their their work, their business work, and it has a, a line for deductions. You anything from auto expenses and mileage to cell phone to products they purchased, depreciation of uh, fixed assets, and uh, everything else in between. Okay, so is the word deduction the same thing as when people say something's a write off? Is that the same thing? Um, it, it is interchangeable. Yes. Okay. Okay, so write off is just sort of slang for that, like, oh, you can write that yeah. out. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so what? Why do you get a? So, I heard you say standard deduction, and um, I know that some stuff about that is about to change. But why do they give you a standard deduction as opposed to just letting you, you know, take the deductions of things you just have? Why do they do that? Well, basically, when the tax code was written, I think their their uh, looking was. Hey, listen, we have individuals who you know have a house and a mortgage and real estate taxes and all that and contribute to contributions. But there's other people who maybe don't have that house. Maybe they rent. We want to be able to give them a little something back as a deduction as well. Because without the standard deduction, some individuals who do not own a house and all that may have little to no itemized deductions. So their bed deduction will be a lot lower than what the standard deduction would be. Okay. So – so it gives them a little something, but also gives those individuals who have possibly invested in a house or do a lot of charitable contributions or have a, a lot of you know state income tax or whatever, an opportunity to get a higher deduction for that by itemizing. I see. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, so what is changing about the standard deduction now? Like what, what was, what is it now and what might it be changing to? Well, actually it's not might because the tax law just passed. Oh, it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it did pass both the Senate and the House and was signed in actually this morning from uh, President Trump, from what I understand. This so morning. It, um, oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it happened already. It just happened a few days ago. They signed it into law. They, they move fast, good or bad. That's to be seen, I guess, you know. But basically, um, we'll just talk about the standard deduction right now. Basically, okay. a standard deduction, you know, is a set price depending on your filing status. So, for instance, if you filed single – you know, um, head of household or, you know, married filing, jointly married filing separate, there was a, a certain standard deduction, you know, that you would take. And I'm trying to find the exact numbers right now, but basically they get doubled up practically under the new tax bill. So for instance, individuals was 60, or I'm sorry, married joint was $6,450 as a standard deduction. They're doubling that to $12,000, you know, not quite doubling. Um, single individuals, it was around $3,600. They're making it $6,000. So if you do use a standard deduction, you're getting a lot bigger deduction going forward here for 2018 and forward. Okay. That's a good thing. It is. It is. Now, as far as the itemized deductions, um, would you like to get into that a little bit right now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Under the, uh, the existing rules for 2017 and prior, um, you had a couple different sections. One, you had the medical and uh, dental expense deduction. And what that is, any type of medical bills, co-payments, mileage, prescriptions, you know, um, doctor bills, et cetera, that you incurred over and above insurance, um, you could put in this section. Now, there were thresholds with that that basically said if you're under age um, 60, it would be you have to exceed 10% of gross income to get the first dollar. Anyone over above 60, it'd be only 7.5%. So a lot of individuals did not get that deduction. Going, right. going forward here, the threshold is lower to 7.5% for everyone. So some individuals may get a little more benefit of that where it gets some deductions where they couldn't before, but it's still hard to, to get regardless. You know, The second, oh. se the second section deals with state and uh, local taxes. And uh, you may have heard a lot about the SALT, which is the state and local tax deduction it stands for. And basically what the new bill, under the old bill, any state taxes withheld or income taxes paid with your return during the year, plus real estate taxes on a, a primary residence and a secondary you know, residence or, or house you own, property you own, plus taxes paid on vehicles, um, motorcycles, boats, RVs, things like that. Or 
In addition, if you were in a state that did not have income taxes, such as you know a uh, Del uh, Delaware, a Tennessee, a Florida, things like that, you could deduct an estimate of the sales taxes paid during a year in lieu of state income taxes. Now, that was under the old law. Going forward here, basically they are capping those amounts. Um, and they're capping them at $10,000, you know, for pretty much most individuals that would have those type of deductions. So you're losing some of it or some that you possibly could have, but it will be reduced for a lot of individuals. The next okay. section gets into, gets into mortgage interest. And the rules pretty much have not changed there except for two parts. Um, under the old rules, you could deduct the mortgage interest on your primary residence and a second residence or, or property or whatnot. And the cap on that was the mortgage can only be up to a million dollar loan. So if you had a less than a million dollar loan, you can deduct 100% of it. If it's over a million dollars, your deduction was limited. And also the second part of that, under the old rules, line of credits, home equity, home equity line of credits, you could also deduct that interest. Now, going forward here, the home equity line of interest deduction is no more. So for any individual that has a, a home equity line of credit that they were deducting, they wanna, may want to look to roll that over into a regular traditional mortgage. Oh, that's um, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that I didn't know prior and just kind of learned about this morning myself. Oh, wow. As, okay. Yeah. And as far as the uh, regular mortgage deduction, pretty much those caps are go are dropping down like $750,000 for your mortgage. So if you have a, a, a mortgage on that, your house mortgage is over seven fifty, dollars that will start to get limited where last year it was a million dollars. And then you get for a little further down, you get into charitable contributions. And those rules really have not changed. The only thing is actually a little bit of a benefit is most normal contributions to you know churches, nonprofit organizations are limited to 50% of your gross income. So for instance, if you have gross income of $100,000, you could deduct up to $50,000 of charitable contributions. Any other Anything over that, you would carry over indefinitely. Under the new rules, that limit gets changed to 60%. So under that same $100,000 of income, you can now deduct currently $60,000. So you get a little better contribution deduction if you made a fair amount of contributions over that limit. Okay, so that's uh -huh. something that's something that people worry about as far as when you're in an orchestra, a concern is will the people that are super rich still get tax benefits from contributing to their nonprofit, to their orchestras? Because it's a concern like, oh, no, people are going to stop contributing if it's not a tax benefit for them. So it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like the benefit's actually going going to be better. To, to an extent, it, it all depends on the amount of the itemized deductions or standard deductions. So if someone in the past was donating and they were able to itemize when the, the standard deduction threshold was you know lower to $6,500 or so, if the standard deduction doubles to 12000 they may not have that um, incentive to make more con charitable contributions because oh. you can get a benefit. So it, 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 w it may possibly hurt or not really hurt, but some individuals who are lower than like than the new standard deduction may not contribute extra. Mm. Um, but those individuals that would that are able to itemize over the new higher standard probably would still contribute to that, and you may get more of them possibly. So it, it's going to be hard to see what really happens with this. You know, my feeling is some people who normally give give regardless. You know, whether they get the deduction or not, they like they like the arts, they like you know the churches, or they have other nonprofits. You know, animal. You know, nonprofits, things like that, they like to give to regardless. I, I feel that they would still do that regardless, you know. Right. Okay. 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 And, so it won't and, be like a deal breaker necessarily. This one law would make a deal breaker for people who, all people who contribute. Probably depends on who they are and how much they contribute and how much money they have and all of those things. Yeah. I, I, I think it comes on mindset. Most individuals who contribute are ones that would do it regardless. Right. You know, that's just their makeup. And that's what they want to do. Um, just for philanthropy reasons, and that's really it. You know, uh, yeah. the tax benefit tax benefit is a bonus, but that may not be on top of their list of reasons why they contribute. You know, okay. possibly. Okay. Um, so, and, and the last. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tracy. Oh, I well. Do you have something else to say about that thing? Because I was going to change yeah. the subject a little bit. Yeah. The, the last thing would be the itemized the the miscellaneous itemized deductions right. that um, does apply to a fair number of individuals. Um, under the old rule, 
and, and mostly these apply to W-2 type employees um, because anyone who's self-employed will get these deductions in a different way on Schedule C. But a lot of times if you're a W-2 employee and you have basically what's called unreimbursed employee expenses, and this is, that's what makes up the bulk of this, this miscellaneous itemized deductions, um, you would be able to, to list those and you'll be able to deduct an amount which exceeded 2% of your adjusted gross income. So again, an example, um, let's say you have $100,000, 2% is going to be you know, $2,000 of that. Um, so anything you spend it over $2,000, you'll get that deduction for. But that was something that a lot of people, especially you know, in your field, in the mus musical field, or any type of performing artist or anything like that, where you have to buy instruments or supplies, you know, strings, picks, you know, with, uh, reads, whatever the case is, yeah. you know, we might be able to add those together and get a little bit of benefit. Now, going forward here, under the new rules, that actually will go away. They're, okay. they're suspending miscellaneous itemized deductions, you know. So, unfortunately, the people who will get hurt with that most would be individuals who are W-2 employees that have to buy their own instruments and things like that, you know. Right. But, um, but I feel a way around that is we could talk about if they're doing other side work in that set up a business on the side and you could take all these expenses and deductions under that business. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now in the same token though, along those lines with the higher standard deduction, it very well may work out that the individuals who maybe got a little bit of that miscellaneous itemized deduction when added to the other ones would still be less than, the 12,000 for Mary Join. So even though they may be losing it, they still may be getting a higher standard deduction than what their itemized would be with those expenses. I see. It would just be something where each individual would have to look at their return from the prior years and say, okay, here's all my itemized deductions, the mortgage contributions, miscellaneous ones, and taxes. And if they get rid of that, what is my standard deduction? It's now $12,000. It may be a lot higher than what you were taking normally. So by losing that, it may be a non-situation non for you. I see. So they can they can just look back and say, oh, okay, this is what I did last year. This, this gives me the story about how this is going to impact me. Correct. I see. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So every, it's going to be an individual case-by-case -case basis to see how it really affects affects them personally on their tax return. Right. Okay. And that's what, that's actually what I was going to ask you next. So that you covered it before I asked you that. <laughs> so, um, so you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned health expenses earlier <laughs> and, um, I wasn't sure if that included premiums for health insurance. Okay. Well, the way the health insurance works is there's two ways you look at this. One, are you an employee or are you self-employed? Um, as an employee, Depending on your employer and what how what they provide to you, um, your health insurance premiums usually come out pre-tax from your W-2, so you'd really not be able to take a, a double dip on that. Take that. Mm -hmm. If for some reason there is a portion of your health insurance premiums that you pay that are not coming out pre-tax from your W-2, you can add those into that health and medical and dental deductions on Schedule A. Okay. Um, and then you have the threshold, of course. If you are self-employed, the rules do allow you, and this is not changing, to deduct 100% of your health insurance premiums for you, spouse, and family, and that number would come right off the uh, 1040 on the front there on um, as a deduction from your gross income. And that just basically self-employed means either you have Schedule C as a sole proprietor, um, you operate an LLC or a partnership and have, you know, that – expenses related to that, like the health insurance premiums related to that, or you're an S-Corp owner and have wages coming out as an S-Corp owner on that regard. So you can deduct 100% of those premiums. Okay, that's good. That's good. And then there was some other law that um, went into effect where you would get taxed if you, or if there would be a fee, right, if you didn't have health insurance at all? Yes. Under the Affordable Care Act, basically you were mandated to have insurance coverage, mm -hmm. you know, for you and everyone within your household. If you did not, then basically you would be penalized. And there's a little calculation where it's a, a flat number of $695 for the year or 2% of this calculation, that calculation, whatever one was pretty much lower. So in most cases, it was $695 per person. 
And now that continues for 17. That will continue for 2018. But for 2019, that penalty will not be there going forward. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, it's very good to know. Yeah, so you will no longer be required to have to have insurance. Now, like anything else, it's a good idea to have the, the health coverage, but you will not be penalized for not having that. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and what about, so we're going to, I was going to ask you about a couple other things people were concerned about with, um, mm-hmm. with regards to deductions. Like what about um, if you have a home office? Is that still allowed to add into a deduction? Yeah, so the home office, and again, depends on whether you're an employee getting a W-2 or sole proprietor, or like a self-employed getting a 1099. If you were a W-2 employee, and this was one of your unreimbursed employee expenses, that would go as one of those miscellaneous itemized deductions, which will be no longer available come next year. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're self-employed, then that would go as a home office deduction on Schedule C or if you're LLC or S Corp, that would go onto those appropriate forms as well. But that would basically, the, the home office deduction, there's there's two ways to calculate it. One, IRS gives you what's called a safe harbor. And that says we'll give you a $5 deduction for every square foot of home office space you have. So if your room is 10 by 10, that's 100 square feet, your deduction would be $500. Or you go through the calculation and say, here's the square foot of the room I have, here's the square footage of my entire house, and come up with a percentage. And then that percentage would be applied to the amount of your mortgage interest, real estate taxes, um, homeowners insurance, utilities. And then as far as repairs go on the house, there, there's two ways. One, there's direct repairs. Which basically, you repaint that room itself, and that's 100% deduction, not so much to that square footage percentage. Or if it's something where you redid the roof or you know, redid the driveway or something like that, that would go as indirect, and that would be applied to that square footage percentage. Now another, part, yeah, now, another part is some people go and say, I want to add in a room, a, build a separate room onto my house for my studio. Right. And basically the way that works is you are able to go and depreciate that. And that would be separate. That would be part of the home office deduction, but it would be a separate depreciation on the, the cost of that improvement. So you basically take the improvement and allocated over uh, IRS prescribed depreciation life and take a portion of that each year going forward as a deduction. Okay. So is that the same kind of um, thing you can do with expensive instruments? Like, um, you know, I know people wanted to know about depreciating, you know, say sometimes people buy really expensive instruments, like a $50,000 cello or something like that. Um, that Can you do that too with, with uh, expensive instruments over time? Yes, yeah. Basically, the, the IRS considers like any type of asset over $500 each that has a life to it that, are, that is used for business purposes to be considered a fixed asset and depreciated over a certain amount of time. Okay. So that, that $50,000 cello, um, depending on what the IRS tables say, what musical instrument's life is. Like, for instance, computers, they say have a five-year life. Mm. Furniture and fixtures have a seven-year life, you know. So cellos, um, I don't know off the top of my head, they would have a certain life as well. Okay. And you would depreciate, let's, let's say it's seven years, okay? Um, even though it may last longer, the IRS says the usefulness of this, we're going to say, is done in seven years. So you would get a percentage each year of depreciation. And there's tables within uh, tax repair software or on the, the IRS website or things like that that would tell you the percentage each year. Okay. But there's, there's also what's called Section 179 depreciation. And what that says is for assets up to a certain amount of assets placed in service, you could deduct the entire cost of it as depreciation the current year. So that $50,000 cello, you could possibly depreciate it the full $50,000 this year. Oh. And a lot, of that, a lot of that comes down to you know talking with your tax preparer or you making a decision, do I want to take it all this year or do I want to push it off over so many years? And that's something we look at, you know, the tax bracket you're in, kind of project forward what next year may end up, you know, looking like. So if we want to spread it out to get some benefit next year and not all this year. So you just have to kind of cross that bridge when tax return prep time comes. I see. Okay. That's great to know because I know a lot of people are in that situation with instruments. You know, they have to have them and they're expensive, (laughs) (laughs) you know. So, And now, again, that applies that this applies for whether you're W-2 employee or uh, self-employed. But again, going forward, 
If you're a W-2 employee, this will be considered that unreimbursed employee expense on the miscellaneous itemized deductions that is being phased out after this year. So if you're not self-employed, you pretty much end up losing that deduction again, unless the standard deduction is higher and you're getting a benefit from that. Right. There's a lot of moving pieces to this whole new tax bill. Right. So I guess it would, it would, um, the depreciation thing, whatever you decide to do would probably depend on if you're meeting up, meeting your entire standard deduction or not. Right. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So if you, um, does it actually make it more simple to have a higher standard deduction? Is, does it make it more easy to figure out your taxes or I don't know? Um, yeah. I mean, basically if it was something where, um, the situation comes away, if your itemized deductions are less than what the standard is, yeah, you want to take the standard and that makes it simpler. You know? So for instance, if you look, if you're married filing jointly and you look back at your 2016 return or even 2017 for that matter, when that gets prepared you say, Oh, my itemized deductions were only, you know, ten thousand dollars. The standard deduction is twelve thousand, so you would get a benefit, and it'll be simpler. Mm-hmm. So you almost have to look at it year by year, go through the calculations of what's my itemized compared to what's my standard deduction, and pick the higher one each year. Because maybe that's, there's that one year where you know I give a lot to charitable contributions, and you're at thirteen thousand dollars. Well, you want to take the itemized at the higher amount than the standard. So each year is going to depend on your situation. It, it may be worthwhile to run through the calculations for both to see what one's better. But the standard deduction is simpler. It's just one number on a line item. Okay. Okay. So it's not. So it just depends on how much you spend, really. In essence, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. As far as, yeah, expenses that go towards your business, essentially. Interesting. Okay. So basically, yeah, this is, so I think I told you this before, but I'll just run it by you. There's, there's basically like two kind of scenarios for musicians. I'm sure it runs the gamut, but like the basics are that either you're a musician with a job in an orchestra and the majority of your symphony, uh, your, your income comes from a symphony. And so you get a W2 and it has like, you know, the bulk of, of what you make. And then you have some income from extra gigs and some teaching and some of that will be 1099 and some of it will be like just extra that you need to um, put in there. And then right. so that so there's those those people and then there are the freelancers who have like maybe a one or two W2s if that's the kind of orchestra they work for because some, you know, some orchestras do 1099s too, I think. But um, right. and then a ma- majority of them will be 1099s. And so um, and then you know, then there'll be also like income that doesn't have 1099s, like just students coming to your house, like each parent doesn't send out, you know, 1099 or whatever. So, um, so then there's the, and then you just have someone who's probably totally self-employed. I'm sure there's musicians out there who don't make any W2 income at all too. So, um, so with that, like, so that's why it would, it's going to vary so much on how the taxes stuff really affects, um, affects each type of musician. But I guess what I want to ask you is, um, for the people who are for all types of musicians, even if they have a symphony job or not, um, does it make sense? Like you mentioned, you mentioned LLC and S corp and everything. How, uh, how do people know if that's right for them to do? Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely something. I mean, one thing I want to touch on, though, is you, you mentioned a W-2 employee and then maybe have a little side gig here, a little work there, something like that. Yeah. Um, with those, even if someone, let's say you do these side gigs and someone sent you a 1099, the question has to be answered, are you out there running a business or not? And the reason I ask that is um, if you're out there you know, actively saying, I'm pulling myself out as a business, I'll do these, these side jobs all the time, call me, word of mouth, advertising, business cards, then you're, you're a self-employed individual on Schedule C. If you do one here, one there at the request of maybe your employer or maybe friends or something like that, and you're not holding yourself out as being in business, then you could just show that income on, you know, as other income on your tax return. Okay. Instead of having to worry about the whole Schedule C and deductions and self-employment tax and all that, you know, and um, 
that might be the simplest. It all depends on your scenario. If you're doing, you know, five, six, seven of them, then Iris could come in and say, no, you're really in the business doing this. But if you do one a year, two years, something like that, you could for, forego all that extra self-employment stuff and just show it as other income and pay a regular federal and state tax on it and simplify that, you know. Okay. Now, as far as those self-employed individuals that have, that do hold themselves out for extra jobs and business or whatever, whether they're still a W-2 employee or they're fully self-employed um, freelancers, um, that situation, what happens is the tax situation is you have the Schedule C. You show your income and you have all your deductions. And we can talk about deductions later or whatnot. And you come down to a net income number. That net income, you pay your federal and state tax on there. But what you also pay is this extra 15.3% federal self-employment tax. Mm. And that tax comes from the Social Security and the Medicare, which totals 765 that normally as an employee would be deducted from your payroll check, plus the 7.65 matching that an employer basically pays. Oh. So you as a sole proprietor are considered an employee and an employer on that, that self-employment income. So depending on the amount of that, how much net income you have from your, your freelance business work, um, you can pay, that could be a big chunk of tax dollars that you have to pay in every single year. Mm -hmm. So what I talk to a lot of clients, you know, about is possibly incorporating. Now, there are two different types of entities that a lot of individuals tend to incorporate or organize to. The first one is LLC, a limited liability company. The LLC is basically a liability protection entity that has the attributes of a sole proprietorship. So, for instance, um, it's easy to set up if you're a single member you would file through the Secretary of State of the state you're in um, or the Business Corporations Division of the state you're in and they pay a small fee and it all varies by state. North Carolina here, it's $125. Um, and then you would basically be organized as an LLC. And at that point, um, you record your business income under your LLC, all your expenses under your LLC. Now, that net income would still be subject to the self-employment taxes. So you're not really gaining much from that. The only thing you're really gaining is not having to file a separate return and you're getting a liability protection. Okay. Now, what I, what I talk to a lot of clients about doing is basically incorporating to be an S corporation. And what that, how that, that is formed, you would file articles of incorporation with the, again, the Secretary of State or Business Corporation Division of your state. Uh, North Carolina is $125. And then you would apply with the IRS to get a federal identification number, which that doesn't cost anything online. And then you'd file paperwork uh, this form 2553 to be um, registered as S corporation for tax purposes. And the way the S corporation works is it has S corporation is its own separate entity, separate from you. It files its own separate tax return, the form 1120S. Now you are the owner of that and you would report all income and all expenses under that S corporation. The S corporation would then generate after it calculates your net income, what's called a form K-1. Now, K-1 will show your share of that net income. So, for instance, if you're a sole shareholder, you own 100%, so whatever your net income number is, let's say $50,000, that K-1 would show $50,000 of taxable income to you, and that would flow through to your personal return. It would not go on a Schedule C or anything. It would actually show on page 2 of Schedule E. And that $50,000 would be taxed at federal and state taxes only, no self-employment taxes. Oh. So in that essence, 15% of that is about $7,600 potentially you could save in self-employment taxes by becoming an S corporation and just filing a separate S corp return for, uh, for a few dollars. So it's well worth looking into. Now, with the S corporation, you also get the limited liability protection as well. So if someone doesn't like your music, it doesn't like what you do, or it gets hurt while you're out doing performing a job and they want to sue, you should be covered by the corporation's liability so that only that liability is subject to any judgment. Nothing personal. Um, now there are don't get me wrong, there are cases where they can basically what's called pierce the corporate veil and go after you personally, but those are very hard to prove and, and slim to none, put it that way. Okay. Um so you have the liability protection. So only assets underneath the corporation are subject to liability and judgment. And then the S corporation, like I said, files its own return 
and it passes through. Now, what happens is because you are not paying any of those self-employment taxes, aka the Social Security Medicare taxes, IRS wants to or says they are starting to crack down on S Corp owners and basically have them take some sort of salary. So as if you're an employee of that corporate S corporation and pay some of those social security, Medicare taxes. So Mm -hmm. what I try to do is at least early on, you know, try to split it like a 50, 50. So if you normally make $50,000, maybe do 25,000 of that as a salary. So you're paying some social security, Medicare taxes, you're throwing the IRS a bone, but you're saving money. So basically if we did, if you had 50,000 income to half a salary, you're able to save about $3,800 of that self-employment tax. So it's well worth it to really consider incorporating into an S corporation. Yeah, that's really significant, honestly, because I've screwed myself every year with an LLC on that self-employment tax. I'll tell you what. Yeah, it's it's well worth looking at. You know, I mean, uh, I said most of the time, like I said, it's cheaper. It's cheap to incorporate. You know, you can do, most people can do it themselves. Some people hire a lawyer to do it. Yeah, there's a few dollars with a lawyer. Um, but it's well worth it in the long run. You know, one you have a little upfront cost, but then you're saving two, three, four, five thousand dollars a year every single year going forward. Wow. So what if you already have an LLC? Can you change it to an S Corp or do you have to shut the LLC down and start over? Nope, you are able to uh, change it. Basically, what you would do is you'd file a 8832 form, which is basically a changed entity form. And that change entity basically says, and there's no fee with it for the IRS, it says, I'm an LLC, I want to be taxed like a corporation. So first thing you would do is file that form, check the boxes, send that in. And shortly after that, you want to send in that 2553 form that says, I want to be taxed like an S corporation. And that is all there is to it, honestly. And then at that point forward, you just file the 1120S and you're good to go. Nice. So is that the same thing? I know people have asked, like, what is that the same thing as a pass-through entity, S-Corp? Yes, basically any L- any multi-member LLC or an S-Corporation basically is considered a pass-through entity because okay. it, it doesn't pay its own tax, but it passes that income to you personally and you pay tax personally on that. I see. So, so they consider it a pass-through entity, yes. All right. Question for you. I got a question. Um, yes. If let's say let's say that you start out with an LLC and then you change it to to an S corp, like let's say mid year or sometime during the year, is it re- can it be retroactive for that year or how does that? Do you have to file two different returns? Okay. Well, the way it works is in, in a perfect world, <laughs> you should <laughs> you should file. <laughs> yeah, in exactly. World, no such right? thing. Yeah. You <laughs> technically you should file the twenty five fifty three to be an S corp within the first two and a half months of the tax year. So if you want to start in 2018, you should have it filed with the IRS by March 15th. Now, if you don't do that and you forget about it or you file it late, there are revenue procedures out there that basically say, hey, listen, I meant to do this as of January 1st. I forgot. I didn't get rep- proper representation. And 99% of the time, the IRS will say, okay, we'll make you retroactive to be an S Corp as of January 1st of that year. So if you if you miss the deadline, it's not the end of the world. You can still go and make it retro, and it should not be a problem. Oh, that's okay, cool. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's great. Now, so, one, 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 so, so, like, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So, like, you could, by March 15th of 2018, let's say, you could file a – um, either an LLC or an S corp. Uh, maybe I'm uh, taking this too far. Can you file an LLC or an S corp that is retroactive for the whole year? For like for 2018 or for yeah. to be applied for 2017. For 2018. So let's say you file uh, an, an S corp or an LLC on like on March 15th or before in 2018. Would it be uh, valid for the whole year? Yeah, I mean, you would want to. You basically, in a, you would want to. Uh, incorporate with the state by January 1st of that year. Okay, or as close as you can get. But the S Corp election, you want to make that by March 15th to be for the whole year. Got it. Okay. So if, yeah. So if anyone's looking to incorporate whether an LLC or an S Corp, I would suggest looking to do that to be effective January 1st, because if you don't, let's say you wait till May 1st and you say, I want to incorporate now you, then you would have four months of, of, the sole proprietorship 
and then eight months of the LLC or S Corp. But so you want to have be organized with the Secretary of State or Business Corporations Division of the state to be either an LLC or an S Corp as of January 1st or relatively close. Okay, got it. So, so would it be better to, because, you know, like January 1st, for example, is a holiday. Right. So what, should you file it on December 31st or should you file it on January 2nd? I'll do it January 2nd. The reason being is if you do it December 31st, um, there is that chance that you would have to file a one-day return for 2017. Right. That's exactly why I was asking that. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to <laughs> I'm really glad I asked you that question because that's a pain in the ass. Like, because, you know, like, well, you know what I mean? It's just a pain, right? Yeah, yeah. for a one day. Um, so, but what about 2017? Say somebody's been an LLC for, and now we're in the middle of December or almost the end. What if you've been an LLC and you said you could kind of go and retroactively change it to an S Corp? Is that too late? Like December, if you say you've been an LLC since January 1st of 2017, is it is it like just way too far late or could you go back and say, yeah, you meant to do this and I forgot and da 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 Could you actually really change it to an, uh, an S Corp for yourself? 2017 that yeah if you're an llc they probably more than likely would not allow that for 2017 to be that far retro okay that way. okay yeah, yeah. Okay. if let's say it was april um you could argue that point and probably have a good position to say hey i meant to do this it's only three months in. i really have maybe have no side job maybe I haven't done any work or whatever for the three mm. months it might be fine but this far into the year yeah i would just plan going forward at this point Okay. So this is really for somebody who S Corp and LLC, but it doesn't sound like LLC is a good option at all compared to the S Corp as far as saving on those self-employment taxes. This is for people who are really like making a good amount of money as a self-employed 1099 and other gigs they're generating for themselves as a, like essentially a self-employed business person musician. So we're, so we're basically talking about um, at what level should someone consider Incorporating. Yes. Um, yeah. There was a, there's no exact level, but basically what I try to tell clients is anyone whose net income as proprietor starts exceeding maybe twenty five thousand okay. um, dollars, give or take. And now don't get me wrong, you can incorporate from day one and have a hundred dollars net income, and yeah, there may not be exact benefits right then, but down the road there will be. But all the paperwork's filed and you're all everything's set up and ready to roll. But from like twenty five thousand dollars on is where it tends to really see some some good gains on say a tax savings at that point. Okay, so say you're getting started on a business and you know eventually you're gonna you're gonna make money, but like right now maybe you're not. So it's still okay to set up an S corp and then maybe the first year it's not looking like you're really, you know, getting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and basically, you know, let's you set up the first year, and let's say you really don't have many many jobs or, or business or that, but you have a bunch of expenses, and you generate a loss. Mm -hmm. Well, that loss will pass through to your personal return and help mm -hmm. reduce any other income you may have. Uh, you may still be wages or it's interest dividend income and all that. So you would still get a benefit of that regardless from day one. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. Okay, that's really important. That's really super important. So yeah, especially people who are getting started. You know, I I know about uh, losses because <laughs> <laughs> I just no. do. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah, that's great to know. Okay, so um, and then one other, oh, go ahead. I was, I was saying one other note is under this new tax law, any type of pass through entity, which includes S corporations, LLCs, and even sole proprietors, they consider pass through. This new tax law is allowing up to a 20% deduction off of your business income. And there's a little calculation with that where it looks at W-2 wages, business income, earnings, things like that. So this new tax lot is beneficial for small businesses to basically get started and you know help reduce their overall taxable income. Okay, awesome. And so, so like this is this is important too because like we were talking about instruments before, and say you buy an instrument, right? But or a bow, or mm -hmm. even you know something less expensive than that, and it doesn't make you go over the standard deduction. And so people might feel frustrated about that because oh, now I can't write off all my reads or all the things that I mm -hmm. bought that are less expensive but still expenses for me and it, it gets engulfed by that, you know, the standard deduction. You didn't spend more than, you know, whatever you said, $12,000 mm -hmm. as a couple or whatever. Um, but mm -hmm. once they have an S Corp and you're using obviously all that same instruments, bows, 
reads, whatever, that can go through into the, you know, the um, expenses for the S Corp, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So basically, yeah, anything that you purchase that's related to your business will be deducted on the S Corp return and then passed through to you. So you would get a direct benefit of that. Correct. Excellent. Yeah. This is really that's important. Right. Yeah. So are there any drawbacks? I mean, it doesn't sound like there are, but I uh, <laughs> thought I'd ask. <laughs> we, should ask the, we should ask a question, right? Right. <laughs> no, exactly. no, no, really not. I mean, uh, obviously you have a little bit of fees to incorporate early on in that. And depending on the state, there might be some annual report fees. Like for instance, North Carolina, they charge a you know twenty five dollar annual report fee. They also have what's called a franchise tax, and right now the minimum is two hundred dollars, and that that is just based on the equity you have in the business or the fixed assets, all that. But most small businesses will have the two hundred dollars, and that's going to be every single year. Whether now on the LLC side, you have the two hundred dollar annual report fee, so there's really not much of a difference there. Put it that way, okay. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, the only other thing some people complain about the, the S Corp is you have to do the payroll at some point, you know, like I talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And some people don't like doing doing the paperwork and paying the payroll taxes and W-2s and all that, you know. Um, depending on how much you have and what you're doing, there are businesses out there, you know, we have a payroll processing side to us. There's ADP, there's paychecks, QuickBooks, you know, also has, you know, payroll processing service as well too. So there are easy ways to, to take, for people to take care of that for you if you didn't have the knowledge and want to do it yourself. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say that because Eileen, you had mentioned something about a service that'll do the ADP. Yeah. ADP. Yeah. yeah. And then is are those fees you mentioned, those are also expenses, right? The fees that you incur. Correct. Yeah. Any type of uh, organization fees and corporation fees, you know, if you hire a lawyer to do it for you and all that, those are deducted as a startup business expense. Yes. Right. Okay. So that's good. That's really good. This is why being in business is such a great thing. Exactly. It really is, you know, from different standpoints, you know, um, a lot of people use businesses, maybe they have a hobby that they want to take to the next level. Well, here's a good situation. You you have the business, you deduct some expenses that normally wouldn't be able to deduct or whatnot. And there are some tax benefits of it too. And again, the liability protection. Yeah, that's a really great point. Cause even if it's not, even if you're a W2, um, say you're a W2 musician, but you have a hobby. I know there's lots of musicians out there who have jobs in orchestras and they have a hobby of, uh, woodworking or making m- mutes for horns yep. or something. And maybe they don't necessarily uh, make money yet, but they want to take it to the next level. Now they can do that and maybe offset some of those drawbacks from the new tax laws on W-2 people. So. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, Eileen even commented about this question that I'm going to ask because as a self-employed person, you know, you, you already have an opinion about it, but um, we talked briefly about tax returns on our last call, and I just wanted you to share your point of view on that because, um, you know, usually you're like, woohoo, I got a tax return. It's, it's money that you got. You, <laughs> you know, the tax refund, right? Tax, tax refund. refund. Yeah, I call it the tax return. I don't know, tax refund. So, well, a tax return is the thing you file, and a tax refund oh. is the money you got back. <laughs> See, I'm not even using the right words. Yeah, so the tax refund, like, I always thought, yeah, woohoo, we get that extra bonus or whatever, but um, you guys are giggling at me. So tell me tell me the right way of thinking about it. I am, I am in fact, giggling at you, yes. <laughs> I think it's funny to call it a tax return. It's hilarious. Yeah, you talk about return and refund. So I have heard people use return in lieu of a refund or that as well, too. So it is out there. Um, it's how you look at it. You know, they're returning my money to right, me. Yeah. You know, if you want to <laughs> Well, the but, uh, only reason why I'm laughing is because the thing you file every year is called a tax return. I yeah. know. And, you know, like growing up, like this is the terminology I heard my parents say. Were you getting a tax return this year? Woohoo! You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. That's where you got it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, yep. So basically what happens is, you know, in the, the, the perfect scenario is you would want to break even with the IRS every year. And what that means is they don't really owe you anything back in a refund. You don't owe them anything major back in tax too. But everyone has different schools of thought on this. There are some individuals who like to have their, basically have their exemptions lower. So there's more taken out of their paychecks. So they get a good size refund come tax filing season. Mm-hmm. And so their, their mindset is, Hey, it's found money. I will use that for vacation or pay off credit cards. Um, 
or something like it's basically like a, a cheap savings account. The downside is Iris pay you nothing on that, you know. Uh-huh. Um, not that banks pay you anything anymore, but you know, it's <laughs> it's better it's better than the IRS paying you nothing. Right. Now on the flip side, there's some individuals who say, you know what, I want this money throughout the year. Um, I don't want to have to owe them anything in tax time. I don't want a large refund come tax filing time. And their mindset is I can take that money throughout the year and pay off a credit card throughout the year at a higher percent instead of waiting till a year later to do it, you know? So they could be using their money more efficiently throughout the year, you know? Now everyone's different in what their mindset is or that me, I wait till April to pay it. Then Um, I really use the money throughout the year and uh, again, pay on a credit card or invest or something like that. And we'll get a little better return on it than than levy is still with the IRS all year. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And then as far I was just going to say, I I think it's kind of a, maybe a laziness thing. Like, uh, just pay extra so you don't have to worry that you'll owe it. Like as if, like the owing is the bad thing and the, the refund is the good thing, you know, as opposed to looking at it like what you're saying. Like if you're paying high interest on a credit card, but you're waiting until April or May to get your tax refund to pay it off, you're paying interest at the same time on that. Correct. Yeah. Now some people have trouble saving and, yeah, then maybe that's one of their mindsets or reasons for having that extra money sitting with the IRS saying, hey, if I had to come up with a balance due, I couldn't do it because maybe I can't save properly or my, my budget is so tight that I don't want to have – I might spend that little extra income I have each paycheck or that, you know. Mm-hmm. So so sometimes it's not a bad thing. And every situation will depend on that that person, their, their personal preferences, their financial position and whatnot. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Plus, also the one, the one thing you want to look at, especially if you're a sole proprietor or even if you're S corp, and you know you have the income passing through. Um, a lot of people talk about estimated payments, mm-hmm. you know, and basically, you know, the, the the idea of estimated payments is to pay in what you think the tax that might be due on your return if you waited till April to file it. So, for instance. If you had income coming through throughout the year and you wait till April, let's say you owe ten thousand dollars. Well, maybe you want to pay that throughout the year in estimates, like twenty five hundred dollars a quarter or some varying amount depending on your situation or that. Because um, what happened is, if you have a balance due come filing time in April and it's over one thousand dollars, the IRS could assess what's called an underpayment penalty. Now, underpayment penalty tends to be about two and a half to three percent of the tax due. At that point. So some people say, I don't want to pay any underpayment penalty. I'm going to pay them throughout the year. And that's where we would have to calculate what we project your income to be and calculate the tax projected on that. And you would have vouchers to pay that in quarterly. Oh. Or some people, some pe- again, some people say, you know what, I'll pay that two and a half percent. I'll pay off that 15% credit card throughout the year. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so yeah, Tracy, I mean, this is probably something you know, but. So I pay estimated taxes quarterly so that I don't have to deal. I mean, hopefully, if I calculate it correctly, I don't right. have to deal with that penalty that he's talking about. Okay. Because so I don't want to pay the 2.5% penalty. No, yeah, no one does. But you'd have to, you'd have to just be really uh, more in communication with what's going on, like looking at things <laughs> in, in communication with your accountant, right? And keep, yeah. keeping on top of it and not sticking your head in the sand about money, which I, I'm i guilty of. I admit it sometimes, you know. But that happens, you know, and, and the way the estimates are based, like when, when I prepare to return, by default, the computer will calculate the estimates for 2018 based on your 2017 actual income. Okay. So if that income goes up or, if that income goes up or down, we could tweak those estimates, you know, but that's something where it have to be communication back and forth to say, hey, Dave, I just got this huge job or whatever, you know, making X more amount of money. We can recalculate the estimates based on that increase in income or say, hey, Dave, you know, what? I'm scaling back about half or something like that. Do we have to make those last estimates? So we can run the numbers and see what we need to do to tweak that throughout the year. Okay. So that's something you can do with your accountant or should you be doing it with your own um, software, like you mentioned QuickBooks, or do you do both? Like, what's the best plan for people in general? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm going to sit here and say the best plan is to get a tax preparer, yeah. but that's being, being a little biased here, you know. Um, <laughs> there are <laughs> there are good programs out there. Um, from a 
bookkeeping standpoint or record keeping standpoint, that's where QuickBooks would come into play. It's a very easy QuickBooks software, is relatively cheap, okay. helps accumulate your income, helps accumulate your deductions and all that into, into one spot. Now, from a tax standpoint, um, there are good programs like TurboTax is out there. And it's not a bad program. Um, I'm not a fan of it. One, I'm a CPA and do this myself. <laughs> and two, I don't like the whole interview stage that it walks through. But the TurboTax and I'm sure Tax Cut and other ones do have a built-in estimated tax calculator in there. So it would automatically create your estimates based on the income you entered for 2017. And then you, could, you should be able to tweak them as well, too. So most tax software should have that based in there. Now, what, what would happen, though, is you yourself would have to go through and, and change it or increase or decrease it throughout the year based on your projections of your income throughout the year. I see. Whereas you know, if, you're, if you're a tax preparer, you say, call up, say, for me, say, hey, Dave, you know, my income's going up by 20000 this year. You know, do I need to change my estimate? And you know, we could crunch some numbers and tweak it there a little bit. I see. Okay, so like... Would you, do you um, charge people every time they call you? Like, you know how lawyers are, you can't just call them up. Like, um, how does that work with, um, if you hire, like how much do you charge? And if you could give us a ballpark, like what, cause I know it's different for certain, um, right. you know, forms yeah. that you fill out yeah. and everything, but how much do you, how much does it cost? Cause I know, I do know a lot of musicians who uh, refuse to, um, uh, consider getting an accountant and they do their own taxes and every year, I mean, these friends of mine, I'm like, you are out of your mind. Like, this is insane. I haven't done my taxes by myself since the year that I worked at a W2 place. And I just made one, like that was my only thing. And I didn't hire somebody right. because it was so simple, but, um, but yeah, like how much does it cost? Well, it depends. Every, every CPA is going to be different, you know, okay. and it's going to change across state lines and things like that. Uh -huh. You know, for myself, um, any, I don't nickel and dime. So you know, emails, phone calls, you know, little stop-ins for a couple minute chat session or that. I'm not gonna nickel and dime to death for that. You know, uh -huh. now, again, others others do, unfortunately. You know, right. um, it's hard to just. I, I have trouble justifying that. You know, um, but as far as return self, I do it on a per form basis. So depending on the forms you use, would calculate the price. So if you're, you let's say an example, you're a, you, you maybe have one W two, your spouse has W two, and you're self employed on Schedule C. Um, you itemize for this year, you know, and maybe have a little dividend interest, something like that. Um, that might be somewhere, somewhere between 200 and 250, depending. You know, okay. now let's say you get into a lot of stock sales or you have a couple of rental properties and all that. Well, that's going to increase the price because a little more work involved, more forms involved as well, too. I see. So, so it all depends, but you know, something in that scenario where you know W two for a spouse may schedule C for other spouse somewhere around there, um, somewhere between two and two fifty, give or take. I see. Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, tell me this: if you had one piece of advice, like one main thing that um, about taxes that you consistently see people do just don't do or they do that's wrong, what would you say that is? Well, some of the things I see is people, you know, maybe don't get – take enough deductions that they're allowed to take. You know, and a lot of this because the tax code is so it, – it's voluminous. It's cumbersome. You know, it, it, there's a lot of detail to it. And not to say I know everything. You know, really no one can say that, you know, in this world. But th there is a benefit to using a tax preparer. There really is, you know, um, just because – I sit down with a lot of clients and we kind of pick your brain. I can't remember what happened a month ago, let, it go, let alone a year ago when you're trying to come through all these receipts. Right. So tax preparers are going to have the knowledge. Oh yeah. These other clients have this expense or that expense or do this or do that and help maybe gather some more things that maybe you weren't, you know, weren't looking at or, or you know, deducting on your, or your taxes or whatnot. Right. So I think that tends to be the biggest one, you know, um, other than that, you know, most of the, nowadays, most of the forms come through to say important tax information on it. So it's gotten easier for people to accumulate some of the income items and whatnot, you know. So, mm -hmm. but the biggest one, the biggest one tends to be just missing some potential deductions. Right. Is what I and and thus saving more money on their taxes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So, are you available for anyone in the audience to contact you about their taxes this year? Yeah, I'd love to help out anyone. And our software allows us to prepare returns throughout the United States. You know, I have clients, uh, I have clients in California, I have clients in Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, South Carolina, um, Texas, all over the place. So, so pretty much we could do return anywhere we need to do. 
Um, so yeah, I am available and I'd love to help anyone out or they can feel free to email me, you know, and I'll be glad to answer your questions as, as best I can. Um, depending, not, not knowing their situation or individual situation or not, you know, that's great. That's such a nice offer. I will make sure that your email is in the show notes so people can just find it right away and, um, be able to contact you for that. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I'm glad to help. Thank you so much, David. This was a great, this is, this has been so educational for me. I mean, and I know that my audience is going to love it. So thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, give individuals more knowledge about taxes. It, it's a scary situation. The IRS could be scary at times for <laughs> that. You know? um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's better to have more information and less information, you know, and uh, there, like I said, there are individuals who, you know, I, I tell you do what you do. I do what I do. And I was, that was, that's what makes the world better off. You know, Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't, play, I couldn't play an instrument to save my life. My <laughs> daughters play, you know, play piano or trumpet or that me. I have zero musical ability. <laughs> that's awesome. That's okay. You can, that's okay. You can help a musician out. Yeah. What's that? You can help a musician out with the taxes. Exactly. That's what I'm here for. You don't for. have to play the trumpet. You can help them itemize the trumpet. <laughs> exactly. You can help them deduct the trumpet. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the opportunity. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you for listening today. Hey, listen, I have a huge favor to ask you, and it will only take a few seconds. If you like this show, one way that you can let us know is by writing a review on iTunes and subscribing to the podcast. Writing a review will help other people to find the podcast and help us immensely. It will only take a few minutes. Just head over to iTunes and search for Crushing Classical. There, you can write a review and click subscribe. Thanks again.